In this week's Technique Tuesday video, I'll demonstrate the plain heel for socks. This sock heel is identical in appearance to a peasant heel or afterthought heel, but the timing and setup of the heel are different. Like most other sock heels, but unlike the afterthought heel, the plain heel is knit as soon as you're done with your cuff down sock leg or your toe up sock foot. You could think of it as an instathought heel. I'm knitting a cuff down sock, so I have knit the cuff and the leg of the sock, and now I'm ready to begin the heel. If you were doing toe up, you would knit the, the toe and the foot, and then you would begin this process when you were ready to work the heel. It works in either direction. So you're gonna start using the yarn that you want to use for your heel at this point. If, it, if you wanna continue using the yarn you've been using, you can do that. If you want to join a new ball of yarn or a contrast color or a different part of the yarn that you've been working with, different part of the ball, you can do that right now. So this first thing that we're doing is we're gonna be working across um, these, the first half of the round. Okay, so I've worked across the first half of the round. Now I need to put the second half of the round on waste yarn, and then I need to do a provisional cast on to create a new base of stitches. Okay, so I have these stitches in waist yarn. I'm giving myself enough of a tail so this isn't going to pull out at all. I like to do a provisional cast on using the waist yarn and the working yarn to create that cast on. And I do it using a long tail cast on. So the waist yarn is going to be my thumb yarn and the working yarn is going to be my index finger yarn. So I'm gonna put my thumb and my forefinger between these two yarns and have them tension just like I would for any long tail cast on. And then I come through like this. And so when I tighten it up, what I'm concerned about is to make sure that I don't have too much slack between the last stitch here and this first stitch. I don't need to be super tight, just kind of mindful of it. And I'm going to cast on the same number of stitches that I just put on waist yarn. So I need 24. So I finished my cast on and I, I cut the tail for uh, the cast on here. So now you can see what I have done is I put these stitches on waist yarn and then I've cast on a new stitches right above them. What just happened? Well, I had knit the sock leg. And so when I started the heel, I worked across these back of the leg stitches. Now, if I was working a toe up sock, this would have been the sole stitches that I'd be working across the first half of the heel. And I got to here. And when I got to here, these stitches right here got put on waist yarn. Those are the stitches that are either the instep or the front of the leg, depending on which direction you're knitting your sock. And so when we did the provisional cast on, what we did was we created these uh, stitches right here. So that is what allows us to now work in the round. We have the same number of stitches that we originally started with. If I had 48 stitches originally, I now have 48 stitches um, that I'm starting with at the beginning of my heel. And now I am going um, to work one full round with just the project yarn. I'm using a technique called magic loop. So I have the round divided into halves. You can do this on two circulars, but you can also do this using double points. So you can either have the round divided up uh, equally on four needles and work with the fifth, or you can have half of the round on one double point and the other half on two, just as you would for any other type of heel. Uh, it works regardless. Okay, so I finished my first round and you're gonna see that it seems like, oh, I've got this long strand of yarn right here. This is, this is going to resolve itself. It's nothing to worry about right now. 
So now we're going to establish um, the decreases and I'm going to work them the way that they're shown in this little swatch here. They're worked identically to how a pretty standard sock toe is knit, the standard wedge toe. Now you might not like the way this band of stitches looks on the side of the heel and that's fine. There are other ways of doing the decreases but I'm just going to show you this method because it's a pretty familiar way of decreasing stitches if you've knit sock toes before and so you can focus on the whole process of knitting this heel and not so much about a new type of decrease. I typically don't use this method of uh, this placement of decreases in my peasant heels or insta-thought heels. I usually uh, do something like this, which places the decreases right next to each other and leaning toward each other instead of spacing them a couple of stitches apart and having them leaning away. And I've done a video that explains how to do this type of decreases, which I'll link to up here. Lately, I've been doing uh, my heels like this which is a central double decrease instead. So you, you end up with one line of stitches that creates that diagonal. I'll demonstrate how to do that in um, a future video, but I just wanna let you know that if you don't like the way this looks, but you like the idea of the heel, that there are some options when it comes to how to do those decreases. So you're gonna knit one, and then you're going to do uh, an SSK which is a left leaning decrease. And then you're going to knit until you have three stitches remaining on this half of the round. So I need uh, two more stitches. So now I'm going to work and knit two together. And then a knit one. Now I'm going to repeat this for the second half of the round. So the round is always beginning when I'm starting on the section with the established knitting and the second half of the round is the round is the half where the provisional cast on was. So after I work a decrease round, I'm going to work a plain round. Okay, so I've finished my plain round and now it's time for another decrease round. I'm going to keep alternating between a decrease round and a plain round until I have about a third of the stitches I started with remaining. So you're not always going to be able to get exactly a third because you're going to be reducing your stitch count by four each time. So I have 48 stitches, so I am going to continue doing this until I'm down to 16. And I'm going to stop when I worked the decrease round that brings me to 16 stitches. I will not work a final plain round after that. So if you have, say, 64 stitches, you would continue doing your decreases until you had about 20 stitches. Uh, and so you may not have exactly one third left, but it'll be about a third. Okay, so I've completed my decreases. And at this point, we need to close the end of the heel. And we're going to do that by grafting. Now, if you are familiar with Kitchener Stitch and you enjoy doing it or don't mind doing it, you can use uh, that to close it. Um, but if you dislike Kitchener or are intimidated by it, there are other ways to graft the heel closed um, that use different processes for doing so. Um, the way I'm going to do the graft is to use what's called the Finchley graft. So for this type of graph, I'm keeping my finger in between those two needles. I'm going to take my uh, darning needle. You'll see the yarn is right here. I'm going to go through that front stitch, just like you were going as if, if to knit. And you're going to go come through this back stitch also, just like you were going to knit it through like that and pull the yarn through. And then you let this first stitch come off the needle, only off the back needle. And now you're gonna come back the other way. And you wanna make sure that you're coming in this time, you're coming in as if to purl through each of these stitches like that. And then you pull the yarn through and the last stitch that the yarn is through comes off the needle. And now once again, you're going to go through 
the two stitches like that and pull it through. Let that stitch come off the needle. Okay, so I've grafted the heel closed. And again, you can use any method of grafting that you prefer. You could even potentially do a three needle bind off um, if that ridge isn't going to bother the recipient. So at this point, you can see that the sock heel has been worked and now you're ready to recapture all of these stitches in order to work the foot. So when I look at the long tail cast on, I look at this waist yarn, you can see how the legs are crossed. And so those two legs are surrounding a particular stitch. And what I want to do with each of these is to capture the right leg of each of those stitches. So I can see where this first cast on is right here. I can capture just the right leg of that stitch and I can do that for each of the stitches all along the edge. So when I'm done, I can count all of those stitches, make sure I have 24 of them on them. And now I'm going to remove this waist yarn. And so this is not like a, a, a provisional cast on where you could just pull it and it would come out. This is a regular long tail cast on that I just was done in waist yarn. So I'm going to have to snip it out and I'm I'm going to do it very carefully. So I have some very sharp scissors. I'm going to lift up that edge and make sure that there's no other project yarn in there and we're going to snip it. So I'm going to do that at a couple of places along the edge, making sure that I am only snipping the waist yarn. And then I can uh, pick it out. So what I like about this method is that the, the method for casting on, uh, the long tail cast on is a familiar method. Um, and you can recapture all of the stitches. Uh, make sure that you have the correct number and that they're all on the needle before you remove the waste yarn. So uh, I, I really like this particular method for this particular situation. It isn't the provisional cast on I use for everything, it's what I use for this situation. So if you have a different method of provisional cast on that you really like using, you can use that instead. Okay, when you have all of those stitches uh, on back on the needle, then you can pull that waste yarn out. So at this point, if you have uh, the project yarn waiting for you right here, you can begin uh, working in the round. Um, but if you have to join it, then you would do that right now. So when you are joining to work in the round, you're going to probably have a problem with, with holes at those corners. And there are a number of different ways that you can deal with it. But I'm gonna show you a technique that I use that works pretty well most of the time. So I look at what I have between this stitch on this needle and this stitch on that needle in terms of uh, loops that are available to me. And I will pick up a loop that, that is near this stitch here, pick it up and put it on the needle. And then I just work those two stitches together. So the one that I lifted up, I work it together with an existing stitch and then I'll knit across uh, until I have one stitch remaining. Okay, so I have one stitch remaining and here I'm going to work an SSK. That, that will be a left leaning decrease. It's gonna keep this existing stitch on top. So I'm gonna slip it as if to knit and then I'm going to look between what I've got here available to me. I can see I've kind of got these little orange stitches I'm going to lift one of those up like that and put it on the needle and then I'm going to work those two stitches uh, together. 
And then for the second half of this round, I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to look for something that I can uh, lift up and work together with the stitch that's on the needle. Okay, so for this one, I'm going to stretch a stitch across onto that needle. I'm going to take this light colored one right here and I'm going to put it on. This may or may not work well. There's always one, one point in the round that it doesn't work as well as the others. Okay, so I did that one and now I'm gonna work until I have one stitch remaining. I'm gonna slip as if to knit and then I'm gonna look for something to, to lift up uh, onto this needle that I can work together. I'm gonna lift this one up. So I've been working the foot of the sock for a few rounds and I want to take a look at those heel corners. So this is where I joined the yarn uh, when I began working the foot and you can see that there's kind of a gap there. This is also where I have a yarn tail and so I can use this uh, as I weave in the tail I will be able to close that gap. If I look at the other side you can see that this, there's no hole there. So usually I have pretty good, look, good luck with one side or the other. Typically there's, there's some little uh, work I need to do on the back side at the corners of one of the sides of the heel, occasionally on both sides, it just depends. So I, if I look on the back side of the sock where that hole is, you can see where I have the yarn attached. And I what I'm going to do is come through um, the, the, the those pearl bumps that we have on the on the back side and I'm going to catch them in a couple of different places that surround this hole. And as I do that, I can cinch it close and it's going to close things up. So I'll I'll just continue doing this. So now I can cinch that closed. When I have it cinched closed on this side, then, then that hole disappears. And then I will weave in this tail. The plain heel has the same advantage as any other peasant heel in that it is knit in the round and shaped with decreases rather than knit flat and shaped with short rows as most sock heels are. It has the same disadvantages as other peasant heels too, which is that for some people the heel can feel too tight across the heel diagonal. In my next video I'll demonstrate how the plain heel can be modified for a variety of fit issues. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.